Big round of applause for Tom from Specto Labs, please. Does anyone here know what service virtualization is? Well, I know you do. <laughs> I hope you do. Basically, if you go to Google and you, you search for service virtualization, you'll get a lot of, um, a lot of hits for big vendor websites and people like IBM, uh, CA Technologies, and they tend to talk about their products with phrases a bit like this. Um, which sounds pretty good. It doesn't really tell you what service virtualization actually is. Oh, so, sorry, I was just saying the third one's the best. Yeah, that's my favorite parallel, whatever. Yeah. So basically, the, the term service virtualization uh, was kind of invented in sort of 2010 by Vogue Research. Um, what happens after that is you see a lot of uh, sort of big vendors brought out. Um, service virtualization products very quickly. Also a company called, well, uh, TA Technologies acquired a company called ITCO um, for their product Lisa, which had been around for a while. Um, there was a product called uh, VIE from Green Hat. Uh, and also uh, Wiremop, which is a tool some people may have used. Uh, it's an open source tool. So basically suddenly uh, service virtualization became something people were interested in. And uh, you started to get sort of uh, big companies sort of repackaging uh, their existing products and service virtualization tools. Also, as you know, basically acquiring, buying in new products as well. But still, at that point, service virtualization wasn't really a thing, according to Google, anyway. Um, then in 2013, um, IBM acquired Green Hat, and then the, the marketing machine kind of kicks in. You see, suddenly, uh, service virtualization becomes a thing. IBM bring out a book, which is called Service Virtualization for Dummies. Um, <laughs> Which makes loads of sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, then a, another open source tool appeared called Mountain Bank. Um, and then a, a later on, a company called Tricentis brought out a, 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 another tool as well. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the different kind of tools that are available and sort of the context of where the whole concept yeah. is, oops, <laughs> has come from. So, but that doesn't really, again, tell you what kind of problems service virtualization uh, is actually trying to solve. Basically, back in the 1980s, uh, big organizations, big corporations, uh, banks, airlines, had mainframe systems. And um, you'd have your sort of client applications or your terminals. And uh, basically, if you, for example, if you were doing a banking transaction, um, the, uh, the, your, your client application would talk to the mainframe through kind of uh, layers and layers of middleware. Um, that still happens, that's still the way it, ha it works. You know, anyone who's worked in the bank probably knows that. Um, then in 2000, you start to get service-oriented architecture, um, more discrete services, talking to apps through an enterprise service bus. Uh, and then these days we have sort of microservices, um, sort of much smaller reusable services uh, talking to each other over HTTP. But with all of these architectures, basically, you have kind of the same problem. And the problem is these little gold lines here. Basically, if you're, if you're building a service or an application, that has to talk to a whole load of other uh, services or other components in the architecture. How do you do integration testing across all of those components? Um, and it's a problem that exists with sort of legacy architecture, and it's a problem that we have with microservices as well. Now, um, a lot of people might argue that microservices has, you know, with all its benefits, it's actually created a new set of problems because complexity really has moved from within the monolith to the network layer. So now you have kind of uh, issues such as network latency, uh, timeouts, failures, um, rate limits if you're using external API, that kind of thing. Also, you might be building a service that needs to talk to some other services that don't actually exist yet. So. Basically, these are the kinds of problems that service virtualization can solve, tries to solve. How does it do that? Well, generally speaking, a service virtualization tool will kind of sit in between your application under test or your application that you're developing and the external service, and it will capture the requests and the responses to that external service and persist there. Um, and then you can usually uh, put the tool into a state where it's basically standing in for the external service. So that instead of passing the request through to the external service, it's actually matching the request to a response and sending it back. So you've got the kind of 
virtual version of the external service having captured the traffic from the real service. And the key thing is um, all service virtualization tools allow you to kind of inject unpredictable uh, behavior into the, your virtual service. So they allow you to introduce uh, latency, uh, random timeouts, simulate rate limits, um, manipulate data as well in, in the responses. Um, and that's the kind of virtualization, but that's what really sets us apart from sort of more traditional um, ways of solving this problem. Again, uh, if you are you know, building an application that needs to talk to uh, a service that doesn't exist, or maybe you have no access to, maybe you can't record and capture the traffic, um, in that case you can kind of pre-configure the service virtualization tool to return certain um, responses to, or match certain responses to certain requests. You effectively using it as a kind of dynamic stub server. Uh, and again, you can simulate real-world behavior in, within, the, within the tool. So there are sort of more traditional ways of, of doing this. Um, you may be thinking um, about mocking libraries. So hopefully you can see though that service virtualization is, is a much less intrusive way of solving this problem. You don't need to import anything into your code. Your application doesn't even need to know that it's talking to a service virtualization tool. Um, happy to discuss the benefits of mocking versus SV later, um, but hopefully you can see what I'm getting at. So I, I kind of like to think of this as a, like a wind tunnel for software. I have to apologize to the uh, CA uh, Technologies Marketing Team because I stole this from them. But basically, if you think about it, um, your application has to perform predictably in a very complex, unpredictable environment. And even the craziest kind of airline test pilot wouldn't get into an aeroplane that hadn't been tested in the wind tunnel. I think the same is probably true for software, or should be. So, how does Spectre Labs fit into all of this? Well, it all began in sort of late 2009, way before service virtualization was called, uh, with a tool called Mirage. And basically, this tool was built for a major airline um, who had a testing problem. They had a, a huge sort of e-commerce website that was uh, dependent on a really expensive ESP for uh, sort of managing seat reservation, meal allocation, things like that. And basically, um, they, they couldn't implement any automated testing at all because they didn't have a test version of this ESP and they couldn't afford it, it didn't exist. So basically, they engaged some consultants to kind of build a virtualization layer that would intercept the traffic between the e-commerce website and the the ESB and uh, then allow them to sort of play it back during their test scenarios. So that Mirage became quite, you know, it was quite successful. It was used in quite a lot of other um, projects across the organisation. It was then it was re-architected um, to kind of allow it to scale out to support load testing. So you could have a sort of scalable back end for your, for your load tests. And then then service virtualization became a thing. Yeah, we've been doing it for years. Um, and a little while later, basically the airline decided that this was a very useful tool that they built. Other people could benefit from it, so they decided to open source it. Um, and to cut a long story short, Spectre Labs was formed to kind of uh, productize and commercialize Mirage. However, um, as you can see, Mirage kind of evolved over quite a long time uh, within an organization. So when we started to talk to other uh, companies about how they could use it, we realized that it had some limitations. It had a number of dependencies, which kind of seems a bit strange if you're trying to manage dependencies by introducing dependencies. So we decided to take a totally different approach um, and do a little proof of concept um, to create a much lighter way, much easier to configure, less intrusive uh, uh, alternative tool that basically solves the same problems. And that uh, tool is called Hoverfly. Um, it's grown from a POC into a project, I've got quite a lot of interest in it now. Um, we're talking to a big US retailer and a UK government department about them adopting it and contributing to it as well. So, Homeflow was, well, was built by Carlos here, so it's only fair that I let him show it off. So it's time for a live demo. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> I spray it a little bit. So. Hopefully. That's actually a nice technique, Tom. I need to get well, this. Yeah, I need to get yeah, this yeah. extra. So I'm uh, someone I need to yeah. demo guy. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> demo guy will crash on the yeah. fire suit. Do <laughs> you want it? Yeah. OK, 
Okay, so I'm Carlos. I work at Open Crida as a consultant. Uh, Open Crida is a company that created Spectrum. Um, so yeah, let's start. I want to go full screen because I have terminals. So, so we have this uh, testing triangle. I don't know whether Tom showed it or not. Can't remember. So okay. <laughs> Uh, so we have unit testing, integration, acceptance, manual testing. Well, unit testing is uh, usually very fast because uh, you just test methods, uh, classes and so on. But you don't actually go through the whole application, like from client to the server and to the database. So, uh, so yeah, that's what integration tests do. So, in our case, we just bring this man, he fixes that, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> testing oh, triangle, and this is our new pyramid, it's not a pyramid, so we integrate integration into unit testing, so you might ask how, because integration testing usually is quite slow, because uh, we have to call external dependencies, and that may introduce something like 3 or 400 milliseconds delays, so that wouldn't work. Luckily, we have hoverfly, and one <laughs> terminal is hidden somewhere. I hope this one. Ah, this one, this one. Okay. Okay, and this one. Yeah, so. I hope the internet is working. No. Good. <laughs> so now we are recording from super fast read the docs API that responds with something like 500 milliseconds uh, delay. So imagine we are running our tests and we only have 50 tests, and uh, this is how long it could take for us to uh, perform like integration tests at unit test level. So it's slow and yeah, I just can't bear that, but <laughs> okay, we survived that. So we have recorded it, um, we can look at the application maybe, what it does. So it actually just calls this and to integrate that we only need to set environment variable. So I uh, prepared that in case I forgot how to set HTTP proxy. <laughs> so, and that's it. Uh, this is our like integration part. So if we if we launch Hoverfly like in virtualized mode, it does that by default, and we tried that again. Yeah. So I actually had to add another method to add like more iterations. So now we are calling 1500 times that. Oh, even more because it's too fast today. <laughs> so we can see that it can achieve. And the one, only thing that slows down is Python. So this is how we can test like uh, integration during the development and during our tests. But you might ask, so how can we use that in like real scenario where we want to um, to use that in actual testing. So I have this example of um, like my main application that requires uh, open weather API. So for current temperature, so I have to insert like my um, app ID and so on. So in order to test this function, I would probably go uh, with Mox if I was 80 years old. So, <laughs> so, in this case, I write this kind of test to perform a setup and teardown. Uh, so, I'm just importing stuff from uh, my testing resources, and testing resources is, is um, sorry, um, I recorded stuff from the real API. So here yeah, we have some uh, JSON payload, all the headers. Uh, so I just modify Apple ID to something like this, because it makes sense. And uh, 
and yeah, I can launch that and I hope it works. I don't know. Yay! <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, second in a row. Uh, and in this test, uh, we can see that I'm testing like for London, uh, for that temperature, max and minimum. And you may think that it could change, but in our case, it won't because it uses hover fly. So this is how we can like group into. Um, uh, we can have different testing resources for every every class, every method, whatever. We can have like a one setup method to uh, like just import hundreds or thousands of um, well requests to Hoverfly. It has a very nice UI. I spent like I don't know four hours to create it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and now a bit more complex example. So if I wanted to implement something like this Google Flights API, because I had to fly to Amsterdam from London. And okay, yeah, but this one. So we have that Google Flights API. We have query like this. Uh, where we have to tell it uh, from where we are going to where, when, max stops and so on. And then it just throws at us some, something like this. You would want to write a mock to this abomination? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so therefore, I actually never registered for that API idea because I thought it. I don't need that. So I created a synthetic service um, uh, to actually mimic that API. So I have like a base template. Um, probably, yeah, we forgot to mention that Hoverfly supports something like middleware. Uh, and middleware is uh, it's a quite cool stuff, actually. You can use middleware in Hoverfly, and you can write it in any language you want. Since I'm a Python developer and a Go developer as well, so I have example for Python middleware. So middleware is a thing that gets executed if you supply it uh, by Hoverfly upon request. So um, Hoverfly passes this kind of payload to middleware, and then you can write code that will well, get this response uh, and then you can change like request or you can modify headers anything actually so in our case I have I'll just show you some I guess a bit well quite simple one this middleware actually takes request body and puts that into a response body and just sets status to 200, and that's it. Uh, so therefore, uh, using Hoverfly, you can write middleware in Python, Ruby, Perl. Uh, yeah, I, I even have a Ruby one. Since I'm a very good Ruby developer, I managed to write something like this. <laughs> it just takes STDN and puts that into STD out. Yeah. And that's it. Also, we have examples for a uh, JavaScript one, because you can also execute JavaScript or not. Why not? So, okay. I hope you understand a little bit more about how middleware uh, reacts in this case. So, okay, we have a synthetic flight service. So, we launch it. We can, we can see that uh, we are launching Hoverfly in synthesized mode. So, no request past this proxy goes to the internet. Uh, it will be captured, it will go to the middleware, and then middleware will decide what to return. So, in our case, this Python middleware will take out uh, origin, destination, date, and will present, hopefully, us with uh, some answer. 
Okay, so... Can I have a question? Yeah. If you don't use middleware, then you're recording stuff and replaying. Uh, if you do no. when you are programming the responses, I'm, I'm deposing. Yeah, so, okay. Middleware is optional. Uh, it's only required for synthesize and modify modes, because without them, it wouldn't make sense. So in capture mode, uh, we are just recording everything. Uh, and middleware affects outgoing requests. So for example, if we, we are doing a recording and we want to uh, add some like authentication headers for like basic app or whatever, so we can put this proxy and any test environment going through Hoverfly will be uh, authenticated to some other external service and that's it. So, but we don't actually need it. We can record it plainly. Okay. For virtualized mode, it affects on the responses. So we can, uh, for example, add uh, delay, and delay would be added just by uh, like sleeping for a while, because it then uh, just holds a th thread a little bit. For synthesized mode, it just generates uh, responses. So in this case, we are trying to call, okay, I'll show you the client. So this is our yeah, client. So we are acquiring this endpoint with this key that's probably not what Google would expect. And also this is our payload. Uh, we take origin, destination, I don't uh, like add something for solutions, channels and so on. So and this is our response. So okay. Let's Okay, let's see whether. And yeah, you see destination is this. We can actually change destination to any. You see, you'll see that now our fire returns this destination. We can add rules like uh, how to be behave on uh, different. Uh, like situations. So in this case I have a rule that uh, destination or origin shouldn't be longer than three symbols because I just thought that would make sense. But uh, you see the main point of middleware is uh, to enable developers or testers to add any logic they want in any language they want. So you can, even if you are not a Go developer, because Powerfly is written in Go, to achieve like superb performance, you can still add middleware uh, in any language. And speaking about performance and uh, other stuff like dependencies, it doesn't have any dependency at all. Uh, it's really autonomous. It uses BaldDB under the hood, so it uses uh, memory mapped files. So during the virtualized mode, it's really fast. It can well like on small machine to choose like 10,000 concurrent users uh, at 800 requests per second. So it's really fast. It's just one binary. We compile on our repository, you can find uh, like releases for every single like architecture possible. So you just download this. All the static files are also compiled into the same binary. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? Uh, so if you're virtualizing a service or an API and it's, it cha the API changes as often do, is there any way for this tool to kind of detect that itself? Yeah, that's one of the feature that I'll be implementing soon. Because um, you see, um, yeah, I'll just probably show the good part about our flies that, yeah, I have deleted everything. Anyway, I'm not recording it again. Uh, we have from middleware examples, uh, we can see that uh, we hold the, all the structure about requests, uh, like where they came from, a uh, scheme like HTTP or HTTPS, destination path, and so on. Uh, and also, we take the structure of responses. 
so yeah, we could actually use the data to run it against the real API uh, during tests or after that and detect whether API change or not. So yeah, good question and yeah, it will be coming into PowerFly sometime soon. How does the record, where, where, so during running, where does it store the, uh, the, the request responses and then how can yeah. control it or because I saw some files also there that are like in, in version control but I'm guessing that during uh, time that doesn't put them in there so no um, it's just one file because this is um, it compiles to just one other file and it also creates a request DB of course if you hit the same you can set an environment variable so you can change the name um, yeah that file is so just for state, yeah. That's it. Cool. Yeah. HTTPS. Yeah. Yeah. HTTPS is also you can record that as well. Uh, you just add a certificate to your machine. Uh, you can get a certificate from uh, a repository. Yeah, you compromise your system, but if you want to do that, you can. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you.